All right, so today we're gonna go over monitor, <coughs> sorry, monitoring, alerting, and visualizing your Node.js server infrastructure with open source tools. First things first, I already had my introduction, but just in case you have any questions after this, please feel free to find me on LinkedIn. I'm also a part of uh, our InfluxDB Slack community, but just in general. So the session agenda. So first we're gonna go over some monitoring basics, why you would wanna use a time series database to store your, uh, your, your data that you're collecting for monitoring. A uh, quick overview of Influx data and some platform tools we're gonna be taking advantage of, including our JavaScript client library. And then some Node.js server monitoring templates, as well as other open source tools I suggest to people getting started with this. And then possibly a Q&A and further resources. So some monitoring basics to go over. So these are what we call the key Node.js application metrics to monitor. And depending on what you're uh, using, whether that be a paid for system like New Relic or Datadog, or making it yourself with more open source tooling, you're gonna have a slightly different list, but these are normally the big ones. These are the ones that would allow you to see latency problems, errors, when people are getting stuck on a website and things are just not quite right, or when your server infrastructure is actually buckling, stuff like that. These are all normally good things to keep in mind and to keep a track of. And one thing to note is that uh, Node.js application monitoring is pretty similar to other uh, server infrastructure monitoring, you know, whether or not you are running it on, um, I'm trying to think of like the Python version of this, um, Flask or uh, Django or something like that, it's gonna be very similar key metrics. It's basically just to make sure that your stuff is healthy. And normally when we're getting these metrics, which is what we normally call them, we're also receiving things like tracing and logging events. So these are normally the big three things that we deal with. We're dealing with our logs, our traces, and our metrics. So for those of you guys who aren't aware, the tracing is especially the ones where the, the trace is like a full stack trace almost. It's basically saying where things went wrong or went right and all the information that goes along with it. Things like time, obviously, as well as you know who was interacting with this, where did it happen, all of those very important details. Metrics can be a little bit more straightforward. It's more something like CPU is at this amount right now. It's normally not as many uh, metadata, I suppose you could say. And then we also have logging, which is somewhat similar to tracing, except for it's normally more inconsistent. So normally that's something like you might log when somebody interacts with a button on a website type of deal, but they're not clicking on the button 24 seven. So with that one, it's more inconsistent as to when the log event might actually happen. One thing I also wanted to mention is the Open Telemetry Project. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because I also do quite a bit of speaking for the Open Telemetry Project as well. And I think it's a really awesome project that's trying to make monitoring server infrastructure a lot more straightforward and easier for everybody. It's a vendor neutral collection binary. It's also vendor agnostic. So although I'm somewhat representing my company in FluxDB, it's vendor agnostic. If you wanna put your data that you collect with the Open Telemetry Collector in other databases or other storage, that's totally fine and up to you. That's why I'm also pointing it out that it is agnostic. It's supposed to be end-to-end -end impl implementation that will generate, emit, and collect, and export that tel uh, telemetry data. And basically what this allows is less of what I was actually funny enough talking about at the very first slide, the fact that depending on who you use for your monitoring, especially a paid one, you're gonna end up with different uh, things that they consider important, different categories. Because there is also such a thing as information overload in this kind of space where you just have so much coming in that it's kind of difficult to discern what's actually important. So the Open Telemetry Project is kind of just trying to put everybody on the same path, getting the same type of data, solving the same type of problems. And the other thing is a path forward no matter where you are in your observability journey, which is basically just trying to say, it doesn't matter if you're a small person building a company with the size of one, or a big company with the size of 100,000 employees or something, wherever you are on that observability journey, they're trying to make it easy to get started. So, time series data. So I've actually already kind of briefly spoke about this, but basically time series data is based on time, which is pretty commonly metrics data. You almost always wanna know what time something happened, what time something went wrong or right, and it comes from multiple sources. Right now we're obviously talking about server infrastructure as a source, but it can also be a lot more worldwide. Things like 
your Fitbit or IoT devices on a factory floor. That's all like time series data. I actually kind of already went over this, but funny enough, this is also the same thing. Metrics, events, and traces happen outside of server infrastructure. They happen again in like an IoT space, et cetera. And finally, the rise of time series as a category. So this is where I just kind of wanted to mention the other uh, database options that you have. So one thing that people commonly do ask me is, why do I need to use a different type of database to store this type of data? Why can't I just throw it into what I'm comfortable with, a SQL DB I've used for many years? And the thing is, it's not that a SQL DB is wrong for this. In fact, for some people, it can actually work, especially on a smaller scale. But the problem is that that's not really what it was built for. It wasn't meant for you to query what happened yesterday between 5 p.m. and 5.04.45 nanosecond p.m. Uh, on this node cluster at this uh, location. It's not really meant for that. It's more about, hey, this node cluster, give me all the data that it's got on it. That's, which is why it's normally used for more like customer records. Now MongoDB actually can be used for this because it's a NoSQL database, but it's actually normally still not quite time series based. They just happen to store the data in a more friendly format for actually getting it back out. They're, they're basically, their queries are a lot faster. Normally their ingest can handle this, but they're not necessarily great for querying time series. And Elastic can be kind of okay at this. I've seen people do it. It's definitely possible, but honestly, I think that it's just best to use Elastic for what they're great at, which is distributed searching and other such uh, metrics. I will say they are pretty good with logs though. But one thing that we're also trying to solve here is not having to store your logs in one DB, your traces in another, and your metrics in another, because that is kind of, it's a lot to deal with, it's a lot to manage, it's kind of aggravating. It'd be nice to just put it all in, you know, one place, which is also a goal of uh, lots of other time series databases. So although right now I'm talking about Influx, most of you guys actually might be aware of Prometheus, another very popular open source time series database, also very popular for Node.js monitoring. So that's another good option. So let's really quick go into what InfluxDB includes. So basically, we take from a multiple uh, data sources, and I'll go into our um, open source ingest ingestion uh, tooling. But basically, with that one, you can actually use it with any type of time series database, not just us. But basically, we collect from all types of places. The data collection then is stored inside the DB. From there, you can run things like SQL queries on it, do a little bit of aggregation and transformations, and then finally port it back out to data visualization and analysis tools, which I'll go into. One thing to note that makes us a little bit unique is that we're built on top of the Apache Arrow project and that our file system is Parquet, and we have data fusion included to allow us to have SQL support. So though we are a NoSQL database, we allow you to query with SQL, which is really nice for people who are comfortable writing SQL, which is actually quite a lot of developers. Most of us have had to or will have to write SQL at some point in our development career. Or we're at least relatively familiar with it. We learned it at some point. The other thing is we're really good now for being a single data store for all those time series datas, the metrics, logs, and traces. We actually used to not be so great for logs and traces. When we finally got 3.0 out, that was one of the big things that we wanted to allow for the community. When it comes to data storage, this is extremely straightforward. Basically, you're gonna have something called a measurement. For this one, for example, it's a server, and a timestamp, and a field set. That's a, those are the only three requirements that you need. Basically, the measurement defines the name of what you're measuring. The timestamp is very straightforward. It is the time that this was taken, and then a field set. So for example, with this one, you've got a CPU and a memory. Those are two, uh, obviously, integer values. And tag sets don't have to be integer values, they can also be strings. For example, you see a host name and a location here, or uh, Boolean values as well. So this is very straightforward, but basically just keep in mind all you need is the field set, the timestamp, and the measurement. And again, although I'm talking about Influx, this is without a doubt the same case for pretty much all time series databases. So Telegraph was the open source ingestion agent I was talking about before. And in the next slide, it will show a few examples of the options that you'll have for this. But basically, it's driven by our community. We like to call ourselves the caretakers. We created it off the bat, but nowadays, like many things in the open source community, it's kind of got uh, its own backers, its own people. It's taken care of by a wide range. And it's simple to configure and extremely flexible. The whole point of it is to be a low code ability to uh, take time series data and put it into either InfluxDB or 
other time series database options. These are just a few of the categories of Telegraph plugins that we have. For example, for the logging, you can see we even have an open telemetry one as well. And these are, obviously, some of these are relevant to this, some of these are not, just kind of depends. I didn't want to have to completely customize this slide. There are 600 of them, so, or 300 plus. I think we're actually at 400 now. Like I said, it grows on its own, and <laughs> it just continues to get bigger, and that's a good thing, because people love to use this tool. The other thing that we'll actually be going into here is our client libraries. Now, obviously, for this conference, we're going to focus on the Node.js one, because that's the most important one. It's the one I also use the most as well. I, uh, I hardly ever touch most of the other ones, because I just write a lot of my code in JavaScript or Python. So let's really quick go into the client library. So this is pretty straightforward. I literally just took this straight out of the docs, not a big deal. Basically, you're just going to install it. You're welcome to use npm yarn or pmp, pnpm. It's totally fine, whichever one. I personally just always use npm because that's just what I'm using as my package manager. But yeah, pretty straightforward. From there, you just set up a client. This is, again, very straightforward. You're basically just giving us your credentials. Your host is just like the URL where you're hosted, whether that be a local host or on the, like um, a web browser, you know, cloud, AWS type stuff. Your token, which is your authentication, and your database, which is just the name of your DB, basically what you've decided to name where you're putting your, uh, your data. One thing to note with tokens, when you create them, make sure that they are both read and write when you're using the client library, so that way then you may both uh, read and write them in. That's a very important note. If you don't give them one or the other, it might be a little tricky in the future. One thing we do suggest also to note is that we do suggest you do like a client.close when you wrap up uh, sending your data in. Again, these are all within the uh, GitHub uh, docs, and I will be linking that at the end of this. So it's pretty straightforward to write into the DB. This looks extremely similar to what I just showed a little bit ago. You can do the line, which is very straightforward, or you can do what we call the point. The big difference here, um, which is something to note, is that in the point, we're actually defining the timestamp. Uh, in the line, we're not defining it. And what will happen is if you don't give us a timestamp, you actually don't have to give it for the point either. We'll just automatically write it as the data comes in. This is perfectly normally fine, but if you're dealing with things like edge devices where it has to be, there might be some, uh, what's the word here? Uh, disconnect, you know, like it's not going to go instantly up into your database. You might want to make sure that you write the date on it because it might, you know, take a couple seconds to go in. The other thing is obviously if you're dealing with historical data, like you are moving data into the DB, you'd obviously want to say your timestamp for your old data. But otherwise, it's extremely straightforward. Querying it back out, also pretty straightforward. As I said before, this is going to be what most of you guys are going to recognize as a SQL query. We even have the query type SQL. It's because we also allow people to use our InfluxQL library. It's a SQL-like uh, language that basically allows you to do a few more extra things. I'm not going to talk about it here, but that's just why it says that. But basically from here, we're saying select everything from our stat where the time is right now to an interval of five minutes back, and I want the units of temperature. So it's pretty straightforward. We're getting just our temperature units back from this, uh, from this example. So now I'm going to go into some visualization options. So obviously, the client library allows you to easily push your data in and get your data back out. So that's pretty straightforward. From there, when you actually want to visualize, so we actually offer our own uh, free Node.js application monitoring dashboard that you can use. The only thing is it's currently being revamped for our v3, but it is usable for our v2 uh, open source users. We have quite a few people who, when this first came out like a year or two ago, I got them on it. They found it very helpful to you know, be able to monitor, and they love the fact that they didn't have to do all of these little graphs themselves or all the queries themselves. So we're currently working on revamping this. It's just there's, there's always uh, engineering timelines. We have also monitoring dashboard options in Grafana, which we also suggest, and I've also helped people set up, because quite a lot of people like to use Grafana as a visualization option. It's great, has an open source, and obviously a paid version if you prefer that, but they also allow for quite a lot of in-depth graphing. Though I will admit, when it comes to server monitoring, your graphs are actually pretty normally quite basic. They're normally just a lot of line graphs, maybe a few you know, bar graphs. We're not getting into anything too crazy here. <laughs> um, but. Yes, yeah, so this is a Grafana option. They also have a downloadable file, completely free. 
If you want to build it yourself, you can also use a library like the Apache Superset one. This one, they don't have, uh, that I could find personally, a Node.js dashboard that you could just easily download and plug and play to an extent. But we do have a connector with Superset, so that does make it quite easy to just be able to query your data here, basically. The other one we also have a connector with is Plotly. Plotly.js is also just really awesome in general. If you ever need graphing on like a website or a project, this is what I've used for many, many years. I quite quite love it. It's pretty good. It's 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 uh, the front end developer in me says it's at least visually appealing enough. I have like a threshold in my mind where you know it's it's got to be just pretty enough, and this meets my criteria of pretty enough. And as you can see, even over here, they have this like analytic analytical apps with Dash. Like we are not graphing anything like that for our server monitoring. And in, in theory, maybe maybe one day, but not right now. At least I've never seen anyone use them. Some extra mentions that I want to talk about as well. Uh, this is Clinic JS. I've actually talked to some of the people who are maintaining and working on this. It's really awesome. It's an open source performance analysis tooling. Now the only problem with um, a, quite a, a few of these that I'm going to be talking about, and it's not really a problem, it's just something to be aware of, is that they can be hard to use for like a longer term, but they're really great for like, uh, like they're great if your app is smaller, they're great if you're just going to use it like off the handle, like occasionally kind of deal, like all of a sudden we're seeing more issues, so we're going to run all of these on it. But they're not necessarily perfect for longer term. Now, one thing to note though is they also do have an example of using uh, their open source with MongoDB to store the data longer, so that is actually pretty cool. So this one I would definitely suggest checking out. The Express Status Monitor is obviously just going to be used for Express apps, but quite a few uh, Node.js apps are using Express, so I figured I would mention it. Uh, the reports are actually real-time metrics with the help of Socket.io, and if you guys haven't checked out Socket.io, I would definitely suggest it. It's really cool. It basically helps you look for um, bugs and such, and then also Chart.js, which is very similar to Plotly.js. It's just another free like charting library. One thing to note, though, is it's normally a little bit smaller of like a package size. But yeah, so this one, again, is pretty cool. I'm sorry that I didn't actually put like the videos of these moving, but hopefully you get the idea of some of the information it displays. And then Node Application Metrics Dashboard is probably <laughs> one of the more famous ones. I've used this one for years, for sure. Uh, and quite a lot of the people who come to us have been using this as well. In fact, a lot of times people will use all of the above tools I just mentioned, as well as a more long-term tool, or even a paid-for tool, funny enough. They'll use these open source tools while paying for like a Datadog or a New Relic, just because these can still be good for, like I said, smaller projects, you're getting going, you don't have as much to monitor, or you're just seeing a, a weird time right now and you just need to check it. So again, this is great for the performance metrics of your Node.js application. This one is not like Express specific, so it's much more uh, open to many use cases. And these are just some of the resources. So obviously you can check out the Influx data website and see more about our database. The Influx community has all of the projects available, including the Node.js one, our client libraries, anything that we're working on that's like an open source, basically a plug and play. We also have these for the resources. I put up our client library GitHub and our Node.js uh, server template, as well as things like our getting started, our Slack community, which if you ever again have any questions, feel free to join. You can message me directly. You don't have to like go talk to the wider community if you don't want to. And then also obviously just our GitHub. We also offer a university that talks more about like using Influx, but also using some of the tooling that I've actually talked about here, things like Grafana and Superset and such. Those are without a doubt our two closer uh, companions here. And that is the end of my presentation. I wasn't sure if we would be able to do a Q&A. That's only if people have questions, though, obviously. If anybody has any questions, you're free to raise your hand. If not, I won't judge. All right, then I guess you guys get a little bit of time back. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>